Hello, welcome. We're excited to start our session on making the Poverty Report digital. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, and can you go to the next slide? Today, we'll walk you through an overview of our office, talk about the New York City government poverty measure, which covers our poverty report tools and data. Then we will transition to the introduction of the digital poverty report and its design process, where we'll share our usability research findings and do a group activity. And lastly, we will finish off with Q&A. Next slide. I want to start with introductions. We're from the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. I am Bermet Kirikova, and I am a product manager in the product team. I will pass it to Anne to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Anne, and I'm a senior researcher on the Poverty Research Team. Zoe, I'll pass it to you. Hi, my name is Zoe Bordenay, and I'm a product management fellow on the product team. A brief summary of who we are and what we do. Our office uses evidence and innovation to reduce poverty and increase equity. We manage a discrete fund to design, test, and oversee new programs and digital products, evaluate anti-poverty approaches, facilitate data integration across agencies, and produce research and analysis of poverty and social conditions. Next slide. Within the NYC Opportunity, our digital product team oversees the development of public-facing web applications like Access NYC, Working NYC, Equity NYC, Workforce Data Portal, and many other products. We conduct user research, create user experiences, and work closely with internal and outside technology teams to prototype, develop, and set ongoing strategy for these digital services. I will pass it to Anne to talk more about the party research work. All right. Thanks, Bermet. Uh, so now that you know a bit more about opportunity generally in the product team, I'm going to tell you a bit about the poverty research team. We are a small but mighty group in opportunity, and we're responsible for the annual production of the New York City poverty measure, what we often call the NYC Gov measure. So this measure is an alternative to the official poverty measure as it takes into account the unique context of New York City, like the higher cost of living. And we also take into account the value of public benefit programs. Each year, we update our measure uh, to incorporate policy, benefit, and other relevant changes. Ultimately, our work falls under Opportunity's mission, which is to use data to reduce poverty and increase equity. And the annual release of the poverty rate, the New York City poverty rate, uh, was actually mandated in the city charter in 2019. And addition, in addition to producing the rate in the report, we also provide data and analytical support to city agencies and external partners about poverty in the city, as well as uh, aid with equity and demographic analyses. All right, before getting to the actual report and current data tools, I'm going to tell you a bit about the NYC Gov measure itself. Like the official poverty measure, the NYC Gov measure reflects people's abilities to meet their basic needs, and it does so by considering the cost of those basic needs, as well as the resources families have to meet them. However, the way we account for these costs and these resources differs considerably from the official measure. So a poverty threshold represents the cost of basic needs. And the official poverty threshold was originally developed in the 60s, defined as three times the cost of the economy food plan. And it's remained largely unchanged since, except for annual inflation adjustments. And there's no geographic adjustment for cost of living. So a threshold for a small town in Iowa also applies to New York City. By contrast, our measure takes much more into account. We define it as a 33rd percentile of what families are spending on food, clothing, shelter, utilities, plus an additional 20%. And we update these values based on data from the Consumer Expenditure Survey. And we also include a geographic adjustment to account for the higher housing costs in the city. This all means that our threshold is higher than that of the official poverty measure. So for example, in 2019, the official poverty threshold for a family of four was about $26,000, whereas our threshold for that year was $36,000. Okay, so we've established there's differences in how our measure uh, measures the cost of basic needs, but there's also differences in how we measure family resources. So the official 
poverty measure defines a family's resources as pre-tax income and cash transfer payments. So that would be like wages before taxes and income from things like social security. By contrast, we take into account post-tax family income. And each year we actually simulate the tax returns in our sample so we can take payroll taxes and social security taxes into account, as well as factor in income credits like the earned income credit. Additionally, we add the value of near cash and in-kind benefits like food stamps, participation in the school lunch program, as well as uh, housing subsidies. And we also subtract the value of necessities that aren't reflected in our threshold. So these necessities include work-related ex expenses like commuting or childcare, and we also subtract medical out-of-pocket expenses. Overall, this means that the NYC Gov poverty measure differs substantially from the official poverty measure. In 2019, the official poverty rate for New York City was 14.5%, whereas the NYC Gov rate that year was 17.9%. All right, now I'm gonna tell you about the various ways you can explore NYC Gov poverty data. Our team currently has three main tools. We've got a report, we've got an online table maker, and we've also got the open data set. For the report, uh, we produce one each year. One note though, is that our data are based on uh, census, census data that's lagged by a few years. So currently the most recent public report is for 2019. 2020's report is done. We're just waiting on release details. And you can go to the site in the slides, which we'll share out later. Uh, in order to download prior reports. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention earlier, if you have any questions as I'm talking, please drop them in the chat and I'll get to them later in the session. Okay, so I'm about to fly through some slides just to give you a sample of some of the contents in the report. Uh, each year, the report includes a breakdown of poverty rates over time, as well as comparisons with the New York City government measure to the official poverty measure. And we also include uh, aggregated five-year data in order to provide geographic resolution on how poverty varies throughout the city. We include socio-demographic breakdowns like by age, race, ethnicity, gender, and we also include marginal effects analyses. So this plot breaks down the marginal effect effects of how components like uh, participation in food stamps or school meals impact the poverty measure. And just as an example, if you look at the third column from the left, it shows that income taxes had a negative 3% marginal effect in 2019. And what that means is that in 2019, the poverty rate was 3% lower than what it otherwise would have been were it not for income taxes. So if families weren't receiving things like the earned income tax credit, poverty rate that year would have been 3% higher. All right, we also include technical appendices that go into great detail about the methodology behind how we estimate these components. Okay, so the report contains a lot of helpful detail, but there's only so many like plots and tables we can include in a static report. So that's why we have the online table maker. And if you go to the table maker website, you can do things like export your own poverty estimates. So for example, you can choose a population of interest, like let's say you're interested in poverty for children under 18 years. You can uh, disaggregate these estimates by a demographic factor, such as like borough or race ethnicity. And then finally, you can choose your poverty estimate. So in addition to looking at poverty rates, you can look at near poverty rates. And near poverty uh, includes those who fall between 100 to 150% of the poverty threshold. So these individuals aren't in poverty, but they still have a great deal of difficulty meeting their basic needs. And they're like one financial disruption away from potentially falling into poverty. So the near poverty measures a great way to understand a population at high risk of falling into poverty, and it goes slightly beyond just a binary construct of poverty. Okay, now on to the open data. We usually try to release open data sets in tandem with the report. Um, we're a bit behind on the 2019 data though. We're having to update the data dictionary, but it should be available soon. That means 2018 is our most recently available data set, but uh, data are pretty standardized. So everything I'm gonna go over today applies across years. 
One important note, though, is that we're not going to be releasing data for 2020. That's because the pandemic severely impacted the quality of data, and it's not able to produce reliable estimates beyond the citywide level. So data won't be available for that year. However, we will be releasing the 2021 data when we finish the report, hopefully later this summer. All right. A big takeaway about the NYC Gov poverty data is that it's unlike a lot of data sets you can find on open data. And that's because our data are survey data, not administrative data. So administrative data often directly reflects the topic or population of interest, whereas survey data is a sample that represents a larger whole. So our sample data represent a larger New York City population. Also, many of our variables and uh, poverty components are imputed, meaning that we estimate benefit receipt or the value of participating in programs like SNAP, school meals, um, or housing subsidies. Our data don't directly reflect participation. They're just an estimation. So for all of these reasons, um, working with our data requires specific analytical approaches, and those approaches are going to vary depending on your research question. And as I dig into the specifics of the data, hopefully I'll clarify just how and why that is. All right, so if you've worked with data from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey, our data will be pretty familiar. Uh, the ACS data actually serves as the foundation of our data sample. Um, the ACS surveys about 1% of the population annually, so it provides great resolution on local population characteristics like age, sex, income, education. Uh, one note, though, is that our poverty data only includes people living in New York City households. It does not include people living in temporary housing or who are unhoused or living in group quarters like uh, prison or dormitories. And that's because it's just very difficult to construct reliable poverty estimates for these populations. Okay, so from our base ACS data, we then impute our poverty components. And to do so, we use an array of survey and administrative data sources. And the specific methodology varies by component. For example, when estimating the value of participating in the National School Lunch Program, we'll use data from the Census Bureau's current population survey, as well as administrative data from the Department of Education in order to estimate the value of receiving free school lunches. Uh, sometimes we are not bringing in external data, but actually applying federal policy rules in order to simulate the value of certain benefits. Like when we simulate our tax returns, we're just applying rules from the federal, state, and local level to do so. All in all, we use a variety of data sources and techniques in order to construct these estimations. And again, this is why our data are a bit different from a lot of other administrative data sources. It doesn't reflect actual participation in the school lunch program, just our estimation of participation in the context of poverty in the city. All right. So now I'm going to get into nitty gritty of the data. And this table is an example of, official, of a, excuse me, a fictional household that you might see if you were to actually open up the open data set. And there are six people in this household, meaning there are six people who are residing at the same address. The first column, serial number, reflects the household ID, and SP order is the individual identifier uh, for those living in the household. So in this data set, each person has their own row. And in this household, they all share serial number because they're residing in the same household. We've also got an age variable and then a relationship variable. So RELP is a relationship variable from the Census Bureau, and relationships in a household are generally defined in regards to the reference person. So to the right, I've thrown up the labels uh, for this variable, and the reference person is generally the individual in the household who gave the interview. So the relationships are all in relation to that one person. And in this household, we can see we have a family with some young children, as well as a roommate. And you know, people can be living in a household, but they might share their finances or costs of necessities differently depending on their relationship. And one of the fundamental variables we construct in our data is the poverty unit, which indicates groups of people within a household that likely share financial resources. Poverty units are really the 
basis of our poverty measure. We determine um, the poverty threshold at the unit level as well as the poverty resources at the unit level as well. In this household, there are two poverty units. Excuse me, just gonna grab a sip of water. All right, so poverty units are often um, identified by familial relationships in the household. This first poverty unit consists of the married partner, their children, and what looks to be a parent of the reference person, so like the grandparent of the child. And the threshold for this family is for a five-person household. And in 2018, that was about $43,000. The second um, poverty unit in this household is the roommate. So we're assuming that the roommate isn't necessarily sharing financial resources with the other family, and their threshold would have been about $16,000 for that year. Finally, uh, one thing I want to point out is that I mentioned earlier, our data is sample data, so it represents the larger New York City population. It's also weighted sample data, so we have these two weighting factors person weight and household weight, which uh, ensure that whatever estimates we do are accurately representing demographic distributions in the population. So when you're doing your analyses, you're going to want to use one of these two weights depending on your research question. So let's say you're interested in um, understanding the number of children in poverty for a given year. For, the for that analysis, you'd want to use person weight because that's a person level question. By contrast, if you're interested in understanding the number of households with at least one child in poverty, you would want to use the household weight. So just flagging um, these two weighting variables for consideration if you are thinking about doing your own analyses. All right, so this is still the same household, same table. I've just removed a couple columns. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, each poverty unit has their own threshold and resource value. I've just thrown up the NYCGov threshold variable, and that is our variable for the thresholds that I mentioned on the prior slide. And then we also have the NYCGov income variable, and this variable reflects the family's resources. If we think back to the table I was going over earlier, resources are post-tax income. They include the value of benefits like SNAP, housing subsidies, and they uh, subtract the value of like work and medical out-of-pocket expenses. NYCGov income is that variable. So now that we have a threshold and resource value, we can get the poverty rates for these poverty units. And uh, the first poverty unit, uh, their family comes at about 99% of the NYCGov threshold, which means they are in poverty. The second poverty unit is at 133% of their threshold. So they're not in poverty, although they would be um, in near poverty by our definition, because they're under 150% of the threshold. Last variable I just want to point out is the NYCGov POVSTAT variable. This is just a binary indicator of whether um, someone is in poverty or not. And in all, you can see this data is pretty complex. And uh, we have to, sometimes performing the right analyses can be tricky. And because of that, we have a couple sort of recommendations and considerations for working with the data. First is that we strongly recommend reading the technical appendices of the poverty report to understand our poverty components and estimation process, as well as reading the data dictionary. Uh, the dictionary provides variable descriptions, but also some really helpful guidance. The other thing we just want to flag is that you should not use the data visualizer tool on open data for this data set. Um, it's, it's a great tool, it just doesn't quite work for our weighted survey data. A couple other things to note is that you can do a perfectly valid analysis, but still get an unreliable estimate. And this often happens with really small sample sizes, which can arise when you're crossing a lot of dimensions. So let's say you're interested in poverty in children under five enrolled in a public program in the Bronx. That could produce a very small subgroup and small subgroups lead to unreliable analyses. The other thing we want to flag is uh, sometimes your analysis requires pretty careful consideration of the variable you use. So like in the example above, children enrolled in a public program, we include three variables related to school enrollment uh, from the census. So that's why it's important to consult the data dictionary to make sure you're using the right variable or the right combination of variables for your analyses. 
Okay, just to recap, we've got the report, which has a lot of great information about the poverty rates and breakdowns and policy impacts. Um, and then we also have the table maker, which you can produce custom estimates and it will always produce a reliable estimate. So if a sample size is too small, it will suppress them. And then we have open data, which is a really rich data set with a ton of possibilities, but it's tricky to work with unless you're coming in with some degree of technical expertise or you pour in a pretty substantial amount of time to familiarize yourself with the resources. And all of this gets at an issue that, you know, if you've been attending these open data sessions or working with open data, you've probably encountered, which is that, you know, making this data available is essential to civic transparency and innovation. But just because data is available, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be accessible to the groups who could really benefit from it. And that's why we've been working with the product team in order to build a poverty dashboard. I'm going to pass things to Zoe and Bermet now so they can tell you all about that work. And just also flag in the meantime, till that dashboard becomes available, please reach out to the poverty research team. We want to make sure you have what you need. Thanks all. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it to Bermet. Thanks, Anne. Perfect. As you heard from Anne's previous slides, the poverty data can be complex. In order to make it easier for our users to understand and access the data, we decided to start creating a digital poverty report that expands the data we can provide and allow users to make customizable charts to meet the user needs. Our product vision for the digital dashboard is to encourage user exploration, learning, and responsible data use for an extended amount of poverty measure data and comparison. Here are the reasons why we need the digital version of the report. Responsible data use helping users overcome problems of small sample size, applying census weights and choosing correct variables from the American Community Survey. Provide poverty measure data to identify problems and help develop better policy responses. Demonstrate the benefits of public resources allocated to poverty, and show data trends in poverty, such as historic events, geographic, and policy. The poverty research team built an internal poverty dashboard that includes multiple features. You can see on the screen a snapshot that was taken from our internal site. This is an interactive plot of NYC Gov and official poverty thresholds from 2005 to 2019. On the top right corner, users can select a household type and year's toggle to adjust a time range based on the user needs. Users can also download the data in multiple formats like CSV, Excel, and PDF. We use two different colors to show the differences between the thresholds. Here's an example of our map feature. It shows the NYC poverty rates that are broken down by community district from 2015 to 2019. Each district has a hover over tooltip that tells you the percentage of people that are in poverty, including the district name. On top, we have three tabs that show the citywide poverty rate, child poverty rate, and poverty threshold. In this feature, we're showing the difference in New York City rates by demographics and geography. We have various groupings like family type, work experience, educational attainment, age, gender, borough, race, and ethnicity. Users are also able to interact with the chart and compare to different groupings. In this example, we're comparing age and sex variables over time. The Spotlight How Do You Compare feature allows you to make selections on the top right panel to see what poverty in New York looks like based on the specific criteria. The right menu panel has an option to choose your age, living situation, borough that you live in, and education. The proportion is organized by poverty, near poverty, and not in poverty. All right, before we get into the design process, I want to share our office's values. We believe that government products should be built with people who use and maintain them, be accessible and respectful, delivered and tested sooner than later, with a focus on learning and adjusting, open rather than closed, open stores, documenting and sharing work for others to use. Since we started the digital poverty report, we created our design process. We first started from the discovery, which includes understanding the problem, hosted multiple stakeholder interviews between the product team and the poverty research team to start the initial scoping. 
Then we moved to the user research where we identified the audience, created user stories, personas, ran multiple usability testing sessions that I will talk about in the next section. We had to make sense of the user research, synthesize the use cases, key insights, and complete it with a stakeholder presentation to show what we've learned. Our next steps are going to be prototyping and user testing to make sure that our product meets the user goals. User research is a crucial part of the product development process. It involves gathering insights and feedback from users to understand their needs, behaviors, and preferences. One of the key aspects of user research is that it's a continuous process that requires ongoing attention. As a result, we came up with two research goals. First, to identify the most effective method to make the poverty data accessible and clear to users when working with the dashboard, and to better understand why people are using the report and how they use it. Therefore, we conducted 10 one-hour usability testing sessions on the internal poverty dashboard site with researchers, economists, academics, data analysts, and geographic analysts. Here's our usability testing outline for the poverty dashboard. We tested the content on how we present the data, transparency in methodology that included backstory, data sources, poverty metric comparison, language, and of course, the dashboard usage. I will pass it to Zoe to talk about the key insights from the research. Thank you, Bermet. In the next few slides, I'm going to share what we learned during usability testing synthesized into key insights. One key finding is the importance of context in making sense of complex information. Testers desire curated information with a clear message and relevant context to create a shared starting point to draw better conclusions. This can be achieved with data stories, trends, operational definitions, clear labels, graphics, short summarized texts, and sources. During the usability testing, we heard things like, it's important to present key takeaways upfront to see the trends. And I think it's much better to start from an operational definition so we're all on the same page. Another important thing that we learned is that testers wanted to better understand the methodology of the poverty measure. We heard things like, poverty is having less than this threshold, less having resources less than this threshold. What resources are being counted? So testers want a fuller picture of the NYC Gov poverty measure, including its backstory, transparency and its methodology and data sources um, and what data sources are being counted. During usability testing, we also received feedback about demographic categories. All demographic categories in the NYC Gov poverty measure come from the Census's American Community Survey. Language and categories are ever evolving and changing. This makes categorizing demographics a challenging and important task where there is always room for improvement. That being said, we have two key insights. One, special attention should be placed on demographic language. Users need transparency on how the census is, how the census shapes these categories. And two, language about identity is sensitive. Inclusivity is important to testers. Labels should be mindful of this and accurately represent available data. We also wanted to better understand how testers would use the dashboard. We found one feature that was highly important to testers is the ability to download data. We learned data experts and researchers prioritize being able to access and download data. They want to compare data with other variables and equivalent data sources. This may not come as a surprise, but this information shows us the importance of including data download capabilities for any data visualization in future prototypes. Usability testing within, with our internal dashboard was just the first phase of our user research. User research is an iterative process and we're still learning. That's why we've included a short co-design activity as part of our Open Data Week workshop. Now that you've heard Anne's Anne explain the poverty measure and data, we've talked about the product teams and we've talked about the product team's user research. We're going to be using EasyRetro to collect answers to a few questions about how 
you use or would like to use the poverty measure in data. And you'll be able to vote up your favorite answers. And then if time allows, we'll have a short discussion before moving on to the Q&A. So we're gonna change screens now to the activity board. And could you please uh, drop the, the link in the chat? Oh, perfect. Thank you. I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to get in. And if you're not able to open the board, no worries. Please put your answers in the chat with the corresponding number. And we can allow people to come off mute if they would like to ask questions at this time. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is to take a poll. Uh, so the poll question is, do you currently use the NYC Gov poverty measure? So you just wanna indicate with a thumbs up in the yes or no. I'm gonna give a few minutes for the results to come in. Okay, great. It looks like we have a few people who are regular users and a few people who are new users. So that's really exciting for us. Um, and you can continue to do the poll as time goes on, um, but I'm gonna start uh, talking about the question portion. So you're going to have about seven minutes to answer the question. When we get started, please put one idea per comment and use as many comments as you like. We'll give a warning when the time is almost up. Now I'm going to go over the activity questions and share an example for each. So the first question is, how do you currently use or would like to use the NYC Gov poverty measure and data? And I've shared an example below. Um, so for example, as a product management fellow for Access NYC, I would like to use the poverty measure to better understand which benefits programs are most effective in reducing poverty for New Yorkers in order to create strategy to raise the visibility of these programs on Access NYC. Um, our second question is what questions would you like the NYC Gov poverty measure and data to help you answer for your work or studies. So one example that I have here is what policies have been most effective in reducing child poverty? Um, and then my th third question is, ideally, how could the NYC Gov poverty measure and data be useful to your work? If a tool was built just for you, what could would it include and what could it do? So I have included, uh, example here. So like as a policy advocate, I would like a data visualization to share at meetings that would quickly communicate the impact of the social safety net on poverty in NYC. And I've shared an example of what that might look like. Um, so these are just examples just to give you an idea about how you might answer the question. There's no wrong answers. And um, this is just a place to share your thoughts and ideas, and we welcome all of them. Um, and so Bermette, it looks like people have already started uh, commenting, but Bermette's gonna quickly demo how to use the comment feature. Yep. So all you need to do is click the plus button right here and type something that you would like to publish, click save, and then it's gonna be here in the column. Okay, great. Uh, let's get started. I'm going to put seven minutes on the clock and we're excited to see all your ideas. Thank you everyone to participating in this activity. It's really going to help give us insight into designing a dashboard that meets as many needs as we can. While people are uh, entering their answers, I might address a couple questions that came up in the chat. You can just listen, um, but keep submitting your responses. Uh, Christine D'Onofrio has also been in the chat. She is the director of our team and she's great. So she's provided a lot of helpful answers already. Let's see. Someone asked what our source for personal income data is and we get income from the American Community Survey variables. So the ACS provides a couple different variables on income. It provides wage income. It provides income from being self-employed. It also provides income from retirement or social security or disability, um, as well as a couple other sources of income. So we use all of those different income components while we're constructing our measure. So we'll consider people's wages and from those wages, for example, apply the relevant 
tax rules to subtract payroll taxes or estimate earned income credit. Let's see what else. Someone asked uh, a couple really good questions. Um, first was about the math behind the marginal effects chart. So that I think was when I was going over the example of like, if it hadn't been for income taxes in 2019, poverty would have been like 3% higher. So if you look at that chart, there's different components. There's income taxes, there's um, food stamps, there's a housing adjustment, there's childcare costs. These are the different poverty components we estimate. And so if you open up like the NYC open data, you'll actually see variables for these specific components. They begin with EST for estimate. And what we do when constructing a marginal effect is essentially create that aggregate income measure, but then subtract the relevant component and recalculate poverty. So if our aggregate income measure includes all of these benefits, wage income, minus medical expenses, we would just remove that component and then compare that income measure to the poverty threshold. And when we did that for income taxes, for example, when we subtracted income taxes, like what families were bringing in from a child tax credit, the earned income credit, uh, we found 3% uh, higher poverty rates. Let's see. Could you speak to how government interventions help relieve poverty in a broader way? This is a this is a great question, and there's so many different uh, kind of directions we can go with it. Um, one thing that the report does, and that we do in our own work each year, is um, include um, analyses or discussions about policy impacts for the year. So, for example, how did increasing the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour impact poverty? It can be a tricky question because. Our data, as I mentioned before, are lagged by a couple of years. We're sometimes working with aggregated data across multiple years. So uh, sometimes it's difficult to compare like when exactly a policy went into effect, when the data we're working with. But overall, we can track these changes over time to sort of see that, yes, there, there was a, a notable increase in people's income after the $15 minimum wage went into account. And here's how it impacted, for example, earned income credit. People uh, whose incomes might have phased them out of receiving that credit uh, still ended up earning more enough to compensate for what they would have otherwise received as the earned income tax credit. And then uh, the marginal effects also relate to that question as well. We can just look to see like what would happen to people's ability to meet their basic needs if food stamps weren't available or the SNAP program wasn't available or housing subsidies weren't available. I'm happy to come back to that question because, again, so many things we could talk about there. And the other question, how can policymakers use this data to do more of the policies that help reduce poverty? Um, that's something our office really tries to advocate. This report and our data is really meant to illustrate the d various impacts of these policies and programs on poverty rates and really demonstrate um, how effective they can be in helping families meet their basic needs. So we really hope the data and results motivate government decisions and can really help inform policy decisions. One way that we use this data is you know, not just to assess how, uh, for example, SNAP benefits in a particular year impacted poverty for that year, we can also model potential effects. So let's say we were to change the eligibility criteria and increase uh, the income threshold people have to meet in order to qualify for benefits. We can model that potential effect by uh, simulating that in our data, like how many more people become eligible for SNAP benefits how much value would this bring to their family resources and how many people might move out of poverty were uh, this aspect of eligibility expanded to a wider population. So that's just sort of a demonstration of our process. Christine, I think you also have the ability to unmute if you wanna jump in at any point or add to something I've said. And I'll also recheck the questions to see if there's been any updates. And I'm just going to take this pause to say one minute warning. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to what Emma's saying other than um, any way that because we have the American Community Survey, we can't go down to like fine grained geographies like zip codes, but we can definitely uh, help people 
think about the conditions in their community, um, poverty rates, the distribution of poverty in communities. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways we can think about it and um, apply what we know. Okay, I'm gonna give you about 20 more seconds and then I'm gonna jump into the voting explanation. There's, there's a couple of quick questions I can answer from the Q&A. Um, how did we get to this poverty measure? Um, it's an income measure of poverty. There's a lot of discussion about combined income and consumption measures, well-being measures. We focused on this partially to, at the time we did this in 2008, highlight what was wrong with the official measure and what it wasn't counting. Um, the other um, piece of that is that we based it on um, a huge study from the American Academy of Sciences on um, different ways to build a poverty measure. And then we did this in consultation with the Census Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, a whole bunch of people in Washington helped out. Um, so that was how we came to it. And there was one question, um, oh, unhoused persons, yeah. Um, we do not count unhoused persons, um, even though sometimes they are recorded in the census data. The, the issue is that it's hard to, by, the, by our definition of poverty, they have no living costs, but they also have no income. So it doesn't quite fit in, um, but I think we would take separate if you wanted to think about that agency data about unhoused persons and just, and it, I think you can probably assume poverty or near poverty um, for most of the population. Awesome, thank you so much, Anne and Christine. I'm just gonna interrupt for a second. I love that we're doing this Q and A right now. I feel like we're all learning a lot. Um, but for the voting part of the activity, I just wanna thank you for sharing all your ideas. It looks like we have a lot of really good ones. And we like to have you start the next phase of the activity, which is voting. So before you get started, there's a few things to note. You only have five votes. Take a look at the comments under each question and vote up your favorites. So the comments that you agree with the most or that you find the most useful, and we're gonna give you about three minutes and I'm gonna give the floor back to Anne and Christine to continue answering questions. Uh, someone asked if we had a link to the interactive chart that Burmette showed earlier. We do have a link to this you know, beta dashboard. However, it's only available to people on the city network. So if you're like working in a city um, agency, you would be able to access the link. Um, if you do have more specific questions, though, feel free to send us an email. Um, at the end of this, we're going to be sharing out our slides and it will have contact information so that we can get you estimates if, if you can't access it, because a lot of people just won't be able to actually access the dashboard. So please do reach out. Okay, just one minute warning. I hope everybody's getting their votes in. Let me know if you need more time. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for sharing your ideas and for voting up your favorite ideas. This is really exciting for us to see what's important to you and what kind of questions and uses you have for this new digital product that we're designing. Um, I don't think we have time for discussion but uh, we can use the rest of this time to answer any other questions. Uh, feel free to come off mute and we will um, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Feel free to come off mute and or raise your hand. We can gonna give you the mic. <laughs> oh, I do have a quick question. I'm a city employee, just wondering how I could access the dashboard. Uh, I can share the link in the chat real quick. So it. Again, it, it won't be accessible to everyone. So if you try to follow the link um, and it doesn't work, it just means you're not on the city network. Uh, also, just a forewarning, I do need to refresh the, slide, the site. If you go on right now, it might be a bit sluggish, but I'll fix that before uh, lunch today. Got it, thank you. I, I have a, a suggestion actually. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was asking about the um, if, if homeless people could be represented since they're not in the, the census data, I know. And I don't know if there's any way that the, the um, poverty research team could possibly include um, DHS uh, data in this as well. Um, 
I know that, of course, there's always the daily shelter count as well as the point in time, the hope count every year that the city does. And I don't know if there's a way to kind of combine those those data sets. Um, but my my background, I'm I'm in affordable and supportive housing and worked with these these communities for a long time. And there actually are a lot of homeless people who do have incomes, but obviously they're the vast majority of them would fit within this, this group. And I feel like that, at least for myself, at least when I'm looking at this, I am feeling like the data is a little, the, the numbers are a little skewed and the numbers should be higher. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's a really helpful recommendation. Um, I'll let Christine take over. Um, actually, Dan, why don't you go first? I'm kind of thinking about something about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, I'm not sure until looking at the data whether it could be incorporated in the current poverty measure we have, but it's something that is extremely important to highlight whenever we are sharing this measure, to be very clear about its limitations and the fact that it is pertinent to New York City individuals in households and it is missing this. So that's um, also just an aspect of data transparency and communication that is really important to communicate. But I look forward to looking into your recommendations and really making sure that when we share the poverty report, it's super clear what it is or or who it does and does not speak to. Well, I so, guess just, just one, one, one suggestion, I'm sorry, I will I'll stop, but would be even just in the term households. I mean, people who are homeless and those who are unhoused would still refer to themselves as households. And I think just that terminology can be misleading. Right. And, and actually they are in census data and they're counted in the, the in the group quarters data, which we don't include, which would include shelters, dormitories, um, healthcare facilities, et cetera. So so they're there, but but they don't have that kind of data about like what's what's their cost of living, because we can't see, you know, someone, for example, in a nursing home, we can't see if they're relying totally on public assistance, if family are putting money in to support them and what's the effect on that family, right? So, but I think one of the things that we do think about a lot is risk factors and affordable housing is, you know, obviously, you know, an enormous risk factor. So we look at things like, um, you know, in the census, you can see people are starting to double up more, for example, that's a sign of, you know, potential homelessness arising. So we, we do uh, look at that kind of thing, talk about it with other agencies um, from time to time, and, and, and other agencies track this as well. We're not the only ones. So we do think about, but what we add to that is, so here's this household, and now it's doubled up, and how much more strained are their resources in that case? You know, what, how many people are rent burdened? Also, that's being done in many other agencies, but, you know, changes in rent burden over time by location, by different demographic groups, for example. You know, just sort of, just we can see red flags in the data <clears throat> without waiting for people to become homeless. All right, I think we're at time. It's eleven a.m. right now. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Thanks to our organizers. <laughs>